What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Nico from Failery. Failery is a content site for founders and Nico's led their team for the past five years. Their team's mastered their marketing and their site brings in hundreds of thousands of unique visitors per month. They also use a strategy called programmatic SEO. We're going to dive into it a lot deeper in this talk. To make all this happen, we're going to cover the details here in a second. All right, Nico, appreciate you coming on, man. I think first things first, would love to just jump right into this by learning a little bit more about you, your background, and condensed version of how you got to where you are. So with that said, would love to hand the mic over to you and hear your story. Cool. So my name is Nicolas Sardeira. I'm the founder of Failure.com, which is a content site for startup founders. My background is not that extensive because I'm just 21 years old. I'm based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Besides Failure, I'm studying. I'm following an economics degree here. I'm in my third year. They are four years. So I'm finishing next year in December. Nice. And we have a lot of stuff to jump into within this talk, but I think the first one, like the, the one you're probably most known for is Failery. So I guess before jumping into the deeper questions, let's just talk a little bit more about that. Give us the elevator pitch on Failery, what it is, what you're working on and why you decided to start building it out. Okay. So I started Failure around five years ago and I was inspired by IndieHackers.com. By that time, they interview founders, particularly bootstrap founders who were doing it well with their businesses. And one day I did some research on businesses that were not doing it, some businesses that had failed. And I realized that there was almost no information on Google about these failed businesses. So I decided to build the Indie Hackers for Failure. So that is how Failure was started. It was a website with just nine interviews with failed startup founders. And yeah, I launched it on Bruhan, Hacker News, Reddit, and all of the typical launch campaign that uh, most startups generally do. And in the first week, like 10,000 users entered to Failure, and there was a lot of really positive feedback on the website and the content. A lot of people were willing and interested in learning about mistakes and failure. That is when I realized that uh, I was into something. And yeah, since then, failure has grown into something bigger. Nowadays, we are no uh, longer focused only on failed startups. Uh, we also interview successful founders. We publish a lot of uh, content on our blog. We used to have a, a, a podcast. Uh, we send weekly newsletters. And yeah, like there are a lot of different content forms. Yeah. I guess that kind of takes us into our next point, but I think the thing that's most impressive about Failery is that you've grown it to what has become today. We're going to link it within the newsletter and podcast so everybody can check it out. Like very extensive website. You've been able to build that out with a relatively lean team. Do you have anybody else that's full-time on this or is it just you? So I'm not even full-time because I have a university well, yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. and besides me, for uh, many years, I work on this uh, alone. I will hire some freelancers to work on specific things, but I will uh, do most of the things on my own. And last year I did my first uh, hire. Uh, it was a Spanish guy that worked on the project uh, sort of part-time as well. Uh, this guy has since left and now I am working with an Australian guy, uh, yeah, he's working uh, part-time as well on the project. So yeah, I, I'm working with him and we are also working with a few freelancers. Got it. All that, all that said, incredibly impressive that you've just been able to scale it up to what it is today with such little help, so much, or such little manpower. So today we we're talking about this before we hopped on. Sounds like users for the website are over 200,000 per month. And page views are 600,000 per month, which is insane. What are some things that you've done to make this possible with a small team? I know we've worked in the past about some programmatic SEO stuff. What else are you doing to just scale up the users and page views for failure? 90% of failure users come from Google. It is all organic traffic. So most of the things that we have done are related to growing the organic 
the traffic of the website. This includes things like publishing articles, optimized articles, publishing a programmatic SEO projects, updating content, creating a really perfect structure for the website, optimizing the technical settings of the website for SEO, and making sure that the page loads super fast. That is something that I'm really concerned about always, like making the website super fast. And uh, yeah, like working on all of the factors that lead to better search positions and to more organic traffic. And uh, in this past year, maybe two years, I have mainly been focused on programmatic SEO, which is something that we have talked a lot about, which basically consists on creating databases of uh, different things. For example, we have created a, a database of unicorns. And with all of that data, we have created automatically or programmatically more than uh, 100, 200 articles of the style of uh, the best unicorns in the vintage industry, the best unicorns in Argentina, the best unicorns in Buenos Aires or whatever. Uh, yeah, like with data, we create articles in a really fast way and lean way. And that is also why we want, we don't need a huge team to be able to create so much content. How did you first discover programmatic SEO? So one of the guys uh, that does programmatic SEO really well is Peter Levels, and you may know him. He's a founder of a Nomad List, recently a few AI tools as well. And yeah, for all of the projects that he has, he does some programmatic SEO things. For example, he has Remote Oak, and he has created those hundreds of pages of the style of the best shops for software engineers or the best remote designer shops and all those kind of things. So that is when I first came to know about this topic. And then, of course, there are many software as a services, particularly one uh, that is called Zapier, uh, which you probably also know, that does a lot of programmatic SEO. So that is when I first heard about the concept. And yeah, it was like early last year that I first start to experiment with programmatic SEO content in failure. Got it. Yeah. I feel like late to the game and we're just, we've talked about this before, just like we're building on our own programmatic SEO strategy. I feel like more and more people in the business world are like catching on to it and realizing have to adopt some type of programmatic SEO strategy to compete. Um, it's just interesting, like hearing your path and like also hearing how it's worked effectively for you guys and just scaled up views. So you also monetize failure in a number of different ways, whether that's digital product sales, looks like you do some sponsored advertising slots, and maybe a couple others that I'm missing. What are two to three major takeaways that you learned about best ways to monetize a content? So failure is monetized through sponsorships, which represents 60% of revenues. And I'm trying to lower that number. I want to to make more money from digital products and commissions instead of the sponsorships. Then the second source is digital products. We have a course, <laughs> an ebook, some sheets of data, and that represents like another 30%. And then there are affiliate. We recommend like tools, services, and all of that. And we make another 10% of the revenues from that. And a few things that I have learned, the main one will be to increase prices. And that is something that I still have to apply more frequently. I... I find it hard to set prices for sponsorships and I generally make them lower than competitors and the industry average. And yeah, I, w when I increase prices, it, it is because I am receiving a lot of requests to sponsor failure from different companies, but that is not the best way to do it. You have to consistently increase prices as the, web, as the website user base grows. And yeah, you find that what you find, what you believe to be like overpriced is under price for other companies. Our companies know really well how to convert users into paid customers and to get a lot of money from them. So it is even they can even get a return on an investment of a really expensive sponsorship package. And and yeah, that is one of the things that I have learned. And another one is that by selling digital products and ideally subscriptions, but that is not something that I, I'm doing, you have more control of your business revenues uh, sponsorships the amount of money that you can make from sponsorships can fluctuate a little bit and it, it is quite dependent on the market conditions for example i don't know if you had a, a web free or crypto uh, project nowadays 
you will probably struggle a lot to get sponsors because of all the whole uh, market down that it is uh, happening and all of the FTX paying and all of that. By making money through sponsorships, you are too dependent on market conditions. And this is also something that I'm working on. I'm currently uh, trying to make more money from affiliate products and subscriptions of failure rather than from sponsorships. But yeah, those are like two takeaways that I can think of at the moment. Yeah. So it sounds like you're preferring the ones that are just more permissionless where you're like not having to go through bureaucracy of dealing with all these different people that are in buyer seats. So we've had the same experience, like selling one-off sponsorship deals, whether it's with a website or a newsletter. I found it just like a huge time suck for one, like finding these people or negotiating with them or like setting slots and like working with creatives, all this different stuff. And yeah, I don't know if you could set up like affiliate programs or something else that just like increases recurring revenue. I think that's a golden goose of all businesses. So we're on the same spot, trying to move away from advertising based to more subscription based. But it sounds like it's probably the same with you. You could take a lot of the transactional revenue you've received from the advertising based channels and then pour that into recurring revenue channels. At least that's what we're trying to do. But Interesting thought. Let's see. Next question we've got is you, as part of one of those digital products that you're selling through failure, you've written an ebook on product market fit, and you've laid out some of the frameworks that other successful companies have used to find product market fit without giving too much info for free. We'll link that in the newsletter. Could you talk about some things that were surprising to you as you put together the research for that book? Yeah, one of the things that have shocked me a lot is what actually led to the creation of that ebook, which is that a lot of the startups fail because they lack pro market fit. So we did, uh, we have been interviewing a uh, failed startup founder for a lot of years, and we did this research uh, to uh, learn what were the most common reasons why startups uh, that we had interviewed had failed. And we realized that the, the biggest and uh, most common uh, cause of failure was lack of pro market fit. So that is what led us to writing and publishing that ebook. And yeah, as for uh, strategies to get pro market fit, I always recommend superhuman resources uh, and articles on how they achieve pro market fit. They did something really interesting, which was to run market fit surveys. And based on the feedback, they segmented the audience and they focused first on the power users to convert them into super loyal customers. And only then they start working on filters that other no so power users were requesting. So yeah, I always recommending recommend checking the resources on how superhuman achieve pro market fit. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm literally just taking a note on that. I need to look into that too. I vaguely read about superhumans growth and I guess like getting started, but I didn't know about their strategy of going after power users and getting them to essentially sell on their behalf. It's interesting. So I guess the last question we have before jumping into quick fire is it looks like the latest digital product is a course that you're selling on pre-sales, which I guess is related to that, just to validate demand. Why do you think pre-sales are especially important for validation and what are some best practices for creating demand before you launch a product? Yeah, I came up with the idea of pre-sales as a valuation indicator because I knew that a lot of the startups were failing because of lack of pro market fit. So I realized that one way that they could be nearer to pro market fit was to validate their ideas from the beginning. So that is why I wanted to create a course on validation of ideas and investigating the different uh, valuation indicators. Startups generally do things like uh, customer interviews and in some cases pre-sales. And I had done a lot of pre-selling in the past, pre-selling of digital products or even a service that I had created with my brother. So that is when I, why I decided to focus on pre-sales. But the reason why I think that pre-sales is a stronger idea validation indicator than wait list and customer uh, feedback, for example, is that pre-sales don't leave any space for what I call in the course, the niceness gap. Which is that when you are working on a product, the beta of a product, and you are contacting people, or maybe people is checking your landing page and subscribing to your waitlist, and you talk with these people, most of them will 
be nice with you and they would don't want to be harsh and tell you that they don't like what you're building and that they wouldn't pay for that and most of them will tell you things like you're working on something that is great you are solving a problem i will pay for this but then at the moment of charging them money like you keep working on the product you finish the mvp you launch it to the market and you go to these users and try to charge them money you will get a lot of negative replies and you will now be said, told that they are not interested in paying that or that they may purchase that in the future, which actually never happens. And what is good about Princess is that you are charging money users from the beginning. So you are not leaving any space for this niceness gap. If they have to pay for your better product and if they are willing to pay for something that is not even ready, it is because they are really interested in your product and you are solving a really big pain point for these people. So that is why I think that prices are a good idea validation indicator. And there are many strategies that you can use to get demand for, like to get prices. And I go over them on the course. But what I have done in the past was to, uh, of course, leverage Taylor's newsletter. So when I sold, when I created the ebook, I first resold the ebook on the newsletter of Hillary. And since I had, I don't know, like at that time I had five, six thousand email subscribers, I sent an email to these subscribers telling them that I was working on this ebook and a percentage of them are converting to prisons. So that is all, of course, a channel that you can use. If you have an audience in social networks or a newsletter, you can always use that. And then besides that, I have in the past when preselling this service that I mentioned previously, I did a lot of cold outreach. I will find people in social networks or in LinkedIn who I thought that were a good fit with the service and I will send them an email. For example, this, uh, there was this client that we got for that service, which was a guy that was tweeting at the founder of a competitor service, asking him like a question or saying that they wanted to purchase the service, but that they were not sure or something like that. And I sent this guy an email. And I told him like, hey, we are doing something similar to these guys. We can, I don't know, like we can do it for you for less money or whatever. And this guy was like one of the first pre-sales of that service. And yeah, those are two channels that are great for getting demand for your pre-selling product or service. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's why everybody preaches about the value of an email list or like some type of own channel where you can just communicate freely with them, don't have to rely on platforms, but I think it's super interesting. Um, and yeah, we've had a similar experience probably as a lot of other founders do. We have a lot of positive feedback from somebody initially until you actually ask them to open up their wallet. So yeah, not a bit, but interesting. I'll have, to, I'll have to check that out. We'll link that as well. All right, so that's four questions. You ready to jump into quick fire? Sure, yeah. Sweet, so we have these four questions meant to be answered in two sentences or less. First one we've got is what is a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, most of the productivity hacks or uh, recommendations are bad, in my opinion, and lead to, to stress, burning out. So yeah, I don't follow most of the productivity uh, common things uh, and advice. I agree. I've started to come around to that recently. I think some people just try to over-optimize everything. It's like, you got to be yeah. human and just like... Honestly, it comes down to just doing the work, which a lot of people are just trying to avoid, but might be a different conversation. The next one we've got in the last year, what new belief behavior habit has most improved your life? So I have gone back to the gym and I think that is one of, the, of those habits that has improved the most in my life. In 2020 with the pandemic, I started training soccer and this year I get got back to the gym and yeah, I'm super happy with that. And I'm always super motivated when I came back from the gym. Nice. Totally agree. What is one piece of advice you'd give to somebody starting a company today? Yeah, definitely to validate ideas. This is uh, one of the reasons why they fail. So you need to validate ideas and yeah, do the work based on what you get from the market, on the feedback that you get from the market. Yeah, you save yourself so much time and heartbreak just by figuring out if you're actually solving people who they're solving for something that people want, rather. And last one we've got, if you had one ask for our listeners, what will that ask be? Yeah, to go to failure and read our failed startup stories and try to learn from other founders' mistakes. Because, yeah, you 
can not only learn from success, but you can also learn from failures and mistakes. So I will ask you to, if you are interested in beginning a, a starting a company, I will ask you to check failure to learn from these founders. Totally. I'll uh, second that. I think everybody should check out your website, learn something. But all right, man, that is, that's all the questions I got. Again, really appreciate you coming on. This has been incredibly insightful. I'm sure our listeners are going to like it. So just want to say thank you again for coming on. No, thank you for reminding. And yeah, happy to come back in, in the future with more news regarding failure. Huge thanks again to Nico for coming on this week. We hope that each of you are able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Nico, we've linked his social info in the description below. And you can also check out Failery. Highly recommend it. That website is failery.com. For next steps, if each of you have not submitted your info to become a member yet, you can do that through our website at www.confluence.bc. And also, if you want to become a subscriber to the newsletter, we offer a ton of free resources in there each and every week meant to help you become better at your individual roles. You can subscribe there at www.confluence.substack.com. Hope that helps. Hope to hear from you all soon.